13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age This week on 13 Questions, we've got author, researcher, a podcaster, magician, magician, also permaculturist, uh, Gordon White, great guy, buddy of ours down Tasmania, literally the opposite side of the world. I think if you drilled a hole through, that's probably where you'd end up. And uh, uh, absolute fantastic show we had with Gordon, great rapport, and uh, he had some fantastic answers. We had a fantastic time in the bonus section. The bonus section is really great on this one. Definitely worth the price of admission. Um, if you haven't signed up yet, I would head over today, sign up and get Gordon's uh, great answers. Definitely worth it. Uh, I'm going to go to the socials here for a minute. Actually, not to the socials. I, I won't say to the socials. I'll just go to, we have one of our questions. I think it's question three. What book has been most influential in your life? So we posted that one out on one of the social media things. And I thought I'd just go through there and read, That's out, a good idea. read up, out a couple of the books yeah. that have come in. Uh, we've got Cat's Cradle by Vonnegut. Transform Your Life by a Buddhist monk. Can't remember his name. The Bible. Essential spir Spirituality. The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Hag. Literally Saved My Life. Wow. No Time to Say Goodbye. Surviving the Suicide of a Loved One. Made Me Feel Not So Alone. And How Normal Things Can Be One Moment and in the Next Absolute Turmoil. The Truth Vibrations by David Icke. Huh. Radical Forgiveness by Colin Tripping. I actually bought that book. Did you? Just yesterday. Yeah. Really? Uh, on that recommendation. It's influential because it helped save my marriage and change my course as to know how I perceive things. Here's a quote. The beauty of radical forgiveness lies in the fact that it does not require us to recognize what we project. We simply forgive the person for what is happening at the time. In doing so, we automatically undo the projection no matter how complicated the situation. The reason for this is simple. In that, the, uh, that the, in that the person represents the original pain that caused us to project in the first place. As we forgive him or her, we clear that original plane. Original pain. Yeah. Not plane. Mm -hmm. There are no planes. That's the thing. Resentment is just, your, it's your, you're hurting yourself. That's right. You know, so forgiveness is, is huge. And it's the, tough and, to get out of that cycle sometimes. And, and but the, you really got to just battle out. You got to take a minute. And the refuge recovery program, <clears throat> that's one of the main meditations that you're supposed to start doing. Like but start the breathing, focusing on your breathing and doing that. And then every second day do the forgiveness meditation. Like that's how important that is to a lot of, a lot of spiritual philosophies. Like forgiveness is like the number one thing to do to get rid of that resentment. What else we got? Traveler's Gift. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Oh, we already said that one. Did he say No that more Mr. Nice Guy from uh, Robert? Roger? Yeah. Robert? Yeah. Yeah, he's, on, he's in the 13 Questions. Yeah, I forget which episode, but he's in the back catalog for sure. Uh, I think that's enough. Wrap yeah. it up there. And of course... He, Was there he, a lot of repeats? Like, did a lot of people put the Bible in there? Or? Yeah. Couple, oh, yeah. Couple, there's yeah. A, yeah. There's a... Uh, if you go between there and the Twitter, there was, this, I want to say, about 300 replies to that. Wow. And the Bible was probably the most popular. Wow. There was a couple that stood out, and the ones that stood out ended up on a list of books that I got to read. Yeah. I'm actually reading uh, Brothers Karamov right now, hmm. or a novel. Oh, yeah. And some Russian novelists. Cool. You know, it's a little easier to read a novel and get into the story and stuff like that, and you know, there's something to be said for some of those novels. It's, um, you know, it's not just storytelling. I'm just reading one about the North Norse gods, and uh, is it just entertainment or? Is yeah, it, like, it is, but it but it's that's also very interesting because it it's just a, it's a good and versus evil type thing, and you know the the hells and the gods, and it's it's pretty cool. The brothers Karamov so far seems to be a good insight into the human mind. The other thing about the book is it's it's a fiction, but it's it is based on a lot of myths that are actually there. So the guy, I think the authors really tried to keep it as real as they could for what they know of history are the yeah. myths of the Norse gods. So yeah. what were you saying years about? I kind of interrupted you. 
No, I'm only, I'm not very far into it. Um, it's about what though? It seems to be a good insight into like the human psyche. Oh yeah. That's yeah. like what the, I know, next I want to do something by Nietzsche. So I think his stuff's mostly fiction as well, isn't it? No, it's philosophy. Probably. Anyway, when you guys sign up to hear Gordon's great answers, you're going to instantly get answers, instant, instantly get access to a couple of communications courses uh, from TJ Walker, valued at a couple of hundred bucks. Instant for that, seven bucks a month. You can also sign up in the yearly, but seven bucks a month, you get in, instant access to a couple hundred bucks in courses, uh, access to the Discord, access to the 20 some episodes in the back catalog. You get the extensions for all of them. And you'll get to do what uh, what our buddy Stevie did, and you can go if you choose. Members get to go and do their own podcast and find people, find people you know that you think can answer the questions properly. And and that one's out questions. already, right? That one's out. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot of great feedback on it. And uh, Kyle Filson's just came out. That was fantastic too. There's some real heart wrenching stories in there. And um, I forget who else just came out. Ram Feck just came out. Yeah. I haven't listened that to that one. That was fantastic. Yet. I heard that's too. a good one. I haven't yeah. listened to it yet. Um, yeah. So sign up, guys. It's fantastic. Definitely worth the price of admission. Seven bucks a month to get access to all that stuff, and you can start doing your own podcast. You know what else I think we should mention, too, is Marty Hansen came out a while back, and he's been sending us guys to have on the show as well. Um, so if you know of people and you don't, you know, even if you're not, you know, monetarily, uh, supporting the show and, and doing your own interview, you can always forward us guys that, that you want us to do. Yeah. Well, send us an you know? email and yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. look into it. Yeah. Uh, 13 questions podcast at gmail.com. Uh, so yeah, Gordon White. Yeah. Oh, Gordon. Well, I mean, you, you, most people have probably heard him already. He's the host of uh, rune soup, which is a fantastic podcast. And what, what should I say? What the rune soup is about before I get into his bio? It's about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Really interesting. But uh, I'm going to read read most of his bio because it's uh, it's very interesting from from his website here. So Gordon has been in the DeLorean from Back to the Future and the Batmobile, the actual Batmobile. He's related to Sir Isaac Newton. He's lived on two volcanoes. He's dove, he dived in a sunken city. Dove? Dive, dove. Dove, <laughs> Jesus. You're just making up words all over the place. <laughs> oh. So he, he became uh, interested in Western occultism at the age of 13, following a series of intense dreams, or dream experiences, actually. And this interest became a lifelong pursuit. His esoteric leanings found an inspirational overlap with his exploration of the Pacific following... Graham Hancock's classic Fingerprints of the Gods. This led him to study documentary production at a university level, film an underwater documentary about Nan Madal, and then go to work for BBC magazines, Discovery Channel, and the news media companies in both hemispheres. And then after moving to London, he held a senior data and analytics position in global media companies, as well as starting a chaos magic blog and podcast called Rune Soup, which ultimately then led to the publication of his first three books, The Chaos Protocols, Starships, A Prehistory of the Spirits, and Pieces of Eight. Over the course of this journey, he's had the privilege to speaking with some of the world's leading authorities in Assyriology, Religious Studies, Genetic Research, Hermeticism, Psy Research, The History of Western Magic, and Ufology. The overriding mission of his work is an attempt to cohere an evidence-based Western magical worldview that combines history, paranormal research, the best available scientific research, and ufology. It's interesting how all that stuff overlaps. Eh? A lot of the stuff that uh, we talk about on our other podcasts and all this kind of consciousness-based stuff, but he's uh, really overlapping it with uh, you know a magical worldview and uh, the paranormal and a cultural look at everything. It's it's fantastic. Oh, that's, yeah. That's Gordon. Absolutely. He's got some great answers here, and I think you guys are going to love them. Thanks for tuning in to uh, 13 Questions this week. Uh, we're, we're sitting here with our good buddy, well, our good our fellow podcaster buddy, Gordon White. Anyway, we've had him on the show a couple of times. Um, we're always kind of 
always always looking to see what Gordon's up to because it's always interesting. His podcast, Rune Soup, is fantastic. Um, I mean, he's definitely a go-to source on magic, occult, and, and I mean, a little bit of everything, a little bit of everything. Um, so we're happy to have him here today to answer our questions. And uh, yeah, we're super excited to welcome the show, Gordon. Thank you very much for the invite. So we'll jump right into it. We do, uh, well, usually what we do is we'll jump right through the questions. And then at the end of the bonus question segment, that's kind of when we'll leave it open for, uh, for a bit of free flow chat, kind of like we do on the Gramerica show. And uh, yeah, it'll be fun. So we'll jump, I like the sound of it. We'll jump right into it. Of course, you had the chance to peruse the questions uh, for a little while before and not, not catch you fully off guard. But uh, <laughs> we'll jump right into it with what was the best advice ever given to you and would you modify it at all today? Yeah, it's, so it's interesting having the question sent through early, right? Because yeah. <laughs> you get time to think about it. And, you know, I'm not sure in the end life is that difficult. I think, you know, don't be a dick and follow your bliss and then die well, hopefully make it leaving the planet a little bit better than you found it, which sort of means when it comes to best advice, very often it's it's almost prosaic, like it's something that doesn't sound to other people's ears really, really wise. It's just that it was a message that happens to appear in your life at the exact time you need it. So for mine, it was my, um, my first mentor when I was working at a um, magazine and newspaper company in New Zealand. And I, I, I idolized this woman. She ran the magazine department I worked for. And she was always unbelievably professional and really, really hardworking. And I thought she took her job really seriously and was in love with it. You know, um, it's a very high status job to be running like a magazine company back when people actually read magazines. And so we were out for drinks one day after work and she essentially said, um, it's not going to say on your tombstone that you sold a lot of ads because I was kind of getting in my head about work and so on. And here's this woman who is unbelievably good at her job and there at 7 30 in the morning and working really hard and i thought her job was everything to her and she's like it's not going to say on your tombstone you sold a lot of ads and i'm like wow so what i learned that was my my lesson that one um work hard i guess but don't get invested in your job because it's not what life's about and i really thought it was for her and so that honestly stuck with me i got that when i was about 22 and the follow-up would you modify it all today i mean it, to say ads anymore is no longer relevant, right? But otherwise, no, it's 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 a persistent lesson in my life to not um, sort of intertwine my identity with something like a job because that changes and it's a very unsatisfactory way to live. So literally, that was the best bit of advice and it's almost tangential career advice, but that was it and it stuck with me. Um, so it was um, in a workplace environment and that was the best advice I got. Yeah, and for her to make it not seem that way, you know, obviously she's very yeah. dedicated. Yeah. Yeah. That was the bit that, cause if you, I mean, she was a force of, um, say was like, she's dead. She's not. Um, but like, if you worked with her, she was a force of nature and very inspirational and always on point. And you just thought she lived and breathed the job. Um, no, she didn't like, she had a real proper life outside of it. And, and would, when she was at work, she would work. And otherwise that was it. It was just a job and it's not what life was about. And that was, that's been really useful. Um, that's been a really useful lesson for me and it kind of reprioritized what I would not just focus my identity on, but also when you're outside of work, do the things that in fact, you know, um, are you following your bliss? Don't stay at work for the hell of it. And, and, you know, and that was just really helpful, useful advice. And without it, I wouldn't have had almost like the room in my head to do things like start the blog and, and so on. So it's, it's strange that it's just this offhanded comment at after work drinks, but it was probably the best advice I ever got. Wow. Great one. That's, uh, I mean, that's words to live by right there. And as far as work goes, I mean, so many people get caught up in their career and just, you know, neglect that that'll become more important than, than family, health, everything else. And that's, that's definitely not yeah. a good way to be. And, and with a media career, I've been made redundant so many times, but like back when I had proper jobs and this was really early on in my career. And so every time it would happen, there's the there's the shock of it and whatever, um, but it, I would think back to think back to my first mentor's words and be, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> under the next one, it's it's not going to say he worked at Discovery Channel on his tombstone either. Like, come on. <laughs> so uh, that it's um it sounds odd, but thinking about it, it's it's one of those like 
sneaky bits of 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 best advice but i'm sure if you like once you have you know more of these episodes in the can you'll be able to have like a almost like a catalog or a database of them and that question one well i suspect look very similar it'll only break down into two or three categories because i don't think life is that difficult i just think you get the best advice at the time when the best advice is the thing you need to hear most at that point that's right absolutely and a lot of them are like stuff you learn when you're a kid too like i mean my answer to that question was like just you know treat others the way you want to be treated and you'll probably you know things will be better yeah see like it's um uh, it's it's a I think when we first, for guests who read that first question, it's like, oh, God, I need to think of something really clever. Like, there's a trick to life. Like, it's a computer game. And it's, in fact, no, you go into the second door and you pick that up first. Like, that's not it. The 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 best advice is is generally stuff like don't be a dick. You know, that seems seems pretty fair. The stuff you forget in high school. What was yeah. <laughs> What was the most important lesson you learned from your parents? This is a good one. Uh, and like yourself, going through these questions, it, it made me realize how much I have, in fact, been influenced by my family from an inspiration perspective. And it's something like um, self-determination or um, kind of like a stoicism and also pick the right co-pilot for life. So my parents' relationship isn't the most loving uh, one. You know, you'll find there's pictures or videos on Twitter of, like men in their early 70s at the airport w- with flowers waiting for their wife to come back after 50 years of marriage and all that. That is absolutely not my parents. Um, my parents, however, have, they, they put my father through um, medical postgraduate school. They started a business, it failed. And, and it's this kind of like do it yourself quiet determination, but also pick the right co-pilot for life because those two combined raised a bunch of kids and, and had businesses and didn't. And then just quietly, just quietly do it and 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 don't wail, essentially. <laughs> don't wail at the injustices because if you are fortunate enough to live long, um, bad things are going to happen to you as well as good things. And, and I, if I look back over the kind of my parents' life in aggregate has been very inspirational to me because I think they just... They, they did what they needed to do right. And they still, they, I mean, they're retired now, but they're still off adventuring around the world, enjoying their retirement and, and planning those holidays. And they, they lean into each other's failures. To be honest, it's mostly my mother leaning into my father's failures, but um, they, they have their strengths and weaknesses that round each other out. And as a combined team, they just kind of like doubled down and got on with life. And, mm. uh, and I like that. Mm. Yeah, that's great. That's like... Um... Yeah, that's it, it's funny how a lot of those answers end up being more indirect than direct. It always seems to yeah. be an indirect lesson. It's not like, well, uh, one time my daddy sat me down and he said, "Don't do drugs." And I never did drugs. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, cause, you know, if, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to have responsible parents, so I had all those talks that it was like, "Don't do drugs," but if you do and get into trouble, let us know. Like my dad was a drug and alcohol psychiatrist before he retired, so he was realistic about how what kids got up to. And he's like, like, don't do it because, it, like, definitely don't do heroin and whatever. But don't, like, if if you get high and into trouble, like, call us and whatever. So they, were, I got all those good bits of advice, but they're not, not as inspirational or um, less medicinal in aggregate than the actual story of them living their life. Hmm. Awesome. What book has been most influential on your life, and why? And it's okay if you want to do more pick. than one. Yeah, 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 Everyone's yeah. done a I, couple, so. At the very least, I have to split it into fiction and nonfiction. So um, fiction is Lord of the Rings without nice. without peer um, and miles away. And I first read it as a child when I was like early, I guess, elementary school for North Americans. Right. And so because I, I was precocious with my reading age, but I still obviously didn't understand a lot of it. Um, and I've read it dozens of times since, of course. And so it's. I don't know if if it's the book itself or the fact that it was one of the first things I started to ambitiously read independently, that if I go back in my memory of my childhood, this book in Middle Earth kind of emerges from that gloomy part where your memories start to fade because you were too young. And so it's this strange intertwined at the base of my long term memories is is stuff about. Gandalf and hobbits and and whatever. But I mean, in general, the, the reason it's so inspirational, I think, is you can't go through that book without 
knowing that it is in some sense real. So it, it forces you to look at what you consider to be the imaginal or the imagination and, and, and how close it is to the surface and what that kind of implies about reality. So it's, it's a book you can, when you read it, you are in it and, and you have to confront what that means for you metaphysically. Like it's, it has some kind of reality that if you hadn't read anything like that before, you you need to come to terms with. And so it's, uh, I mean, it's remarkable. So from a fiction perspective, definitely Lord of the Rings. And it influenced my life in a sense. I joke about this, but it's only half a joke. It is probably one of the factors as to why I first moved to New Zealand in my early 20s anyway. Like, I, I liked Lord of the Rings enough to go, should I move to Middle Earth? Yeah, I'm moving to Middle Earth. That's what's happening. <laughs> um, so honestly, it, it it's, um, there's the kind of deep psychological and metaphysical answer, but I can also point to things like I visited Tolkien's grave over a dozen times and I literally moved to Middle Earth. So um, from fiction perspective, it's Lord of the Rings. Uh, and from a uh, quote unquote nonfiction, I guess, perspective, it has to be the first two um, Pete Carroll chaos magic books. So it has to be Lee Bunnell and Psychonaut and Lee Chaos, which more or less, it's kind of cheating because it's two of them, but they, they essentially come together as a pair. And that absolutely, I'd read and played around with magic before I'd found them, which is still fairly early on. I would have been about 14 when I first read them. Um, but that was, that was it for me. That's when I could see that there's a, uh, there's a way of being in the world that fits me better than any other ones I'd found. And so far, you know, 20 something years later, that that is in fact the case. So Lord of the Rings and Pete Carroll's first two Chaos Magic books. Nice. I got to get more magic books. In the See, that's another great question that we're going to end up with a fantastic library. We're going to start tracking all the books down and it'll be the bookshelf. Oh, good knowledge. idea. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, what, I should do that. That's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> what daily habits do you, or rituals do you have, and do you recommend them for others? Well, I definitely don't recommend my daily habits. <laughs> Goodness. Um, they, they could be improved. Uh, daily rituals, I definitely do. So uh, each morning in the sort of first planetary hour of the day, which is the sort of first almost an hour after sunrise, um, I do planetary propitiation or invocation, uh, and that kind of generally smooths out the astrological space weather. And it's just a good, it's 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 a regular prayer practice essentially. Uh, and I would recommend that to people who are interested in either astrology or magic, but otherwise, you know, live your best lives. That one is guaranteed. It happens, and I would love to say, although it's been a couple of weeks, that I um, generally do some afternoon meditation rather than morning. Uh, and I'd also recommend that on a universal basis. Um, again, it's not a daily habit because it does slip off the list. The the planetary prayer stuff doesn't. Um, but if I if I, if I lied and said I meditated every day, I would I would universally recommend that one. And I'd recommend some sort of um, planetary day acknowledgement if you're going to be involved in things like astrology or magic. Awesome. What would that sort of like, what would that look like in a quick? Oh, um, it's, it's a whole show in, in its own way. Uh, the short answer is you would pick a manual like the Hygromantia or even the Picatrix or, or something that has daily um, prayers or invocations to the planets. So Monday is moon, Tuesday is Mars, Wednesday is Mercury and so on. Right. Um, and you, you can just use an app to do the planetary hour calculations. Cause I am that lazy. I just said that about the habits. Um, and so you sort of know that it's the first hour ish after sunrise because the time between sunrise and sunset is divided by 12. And then, so, and that's your planetary hour. And the same thing for night, which means at the moment you guys have longer days, so your planetary hours will actually be longer than an hour, and mine are getting shorter. And you just kind of either have a space, um, I have a spirit room, obviously, um, but you either have a space where you just kind of quietly um, acknowledge sort of the governing planet or of the day. And it's just really useful to to think about the fact that we we live on this we we all live on an astrological calendar, even if we don't realize it. Like the days are literally the planets, right? And it's just something, the, the medium term effects of acknowledging or just marking this on a daily basis, when people start doing it, the perception is their life kind of runs with slightly less friction. So it's almost like you become aware of, even if the planets, which they are, are metaphors for kind of like just 
currents of life going on. Like there's something about doing it or becoming aware of the general flow of life that makes it flow better. Uh, and so it's it's essential for people who do something like astrology or, or magic. But that's it. It's, it's kind of easy um, from a you don't need any special equipment or anything. You certainly can. Like uh, I have some mine's overly complicated, but this is what I do as a job. And uh, you certainly can have like separate altars and they're pointing in the right direction for each planet and so on. But you, it's one of those things about magic in general or or meditation or whatever, that 80% of the value will come from that 20% first thing. You'll get 80% of, of the, the impact of even just quietly saying the prayer sitting at your desk, if that's the planetary hour. And then there's that other 20% optimization that you can kind of mop up by getting slightly better at it but the most of the value is in just acknowledging it in the first place yeah that's well said makes sense well i think this is probably going to tirate oh actually no i'm on the wrong question never mind if i were to ask your best friend what is the one thing they would say you need to work on the most and why it depends what day you catch him on to be honest uh I think at the moment, and this sounds like poor little me or whatever, but I think at the moment they would say self-care um, with the with the side in the books and the various dramas I've been through in Q1 and setting up the farm and so on. I've had a, um, this comes back to the habits thing, right? Like I could be living a little healthier than I am just from a workload and whatever perspective. So if you catch them on a day where they give a shit whether I live or die and best friends generally, you flip a coin with that, right? Um, it would be that. Otherwise it would be, They'd use more curse words, but uh, I need to learn how to suffer fools a little bit better. Um, but that would be it. It would, If they're in a good mood, it would be probably he needs to slow down at the moment. And if they're in a bad mood, it's like he needs to suffer fools a little better. What are you most... Both are true. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that tends to be the case. Uh, what are you most curious about? I'm most curious about what... Uh, I think that there is a global magic. Uh, I think magic is how is a culture specific way of of interacting with the fact that the universe is in some sense alive, right? Uh, and we haven't done a very good job historically of comparing, say, out of Europe and European cultures into non-European ones for a lot of historical reasons, which is the last hundred and fifty years of things like anthropology have been kind of racist and and whatever. So we're at a stage in the last couple of decades where we're developing new ways of comparing things that we do or have historically done with cultures around the world. And I have this sense, and it, it just kind of makes sense, that there is almost like a global magic. There are things about magic that are universal, that are refracted or, or expressed differently in cultures. And every time we've tried to get to a universal level, like in the 19th century, it's been very hierarchical and, and kind of like... Um, I don't want to say white superior, but like European superior. And so that, that interests me. It's, it's, um, I, and it interests me because I think if we can develop a conception or a good way of comparing across cultures, I think that says something about reality and it also might make magic work better because one of the long running kind of like intellectual interests for people who are involved in magic is why doesn't it work every time? Cause it works, but why doesn't it work every time? And I, I suspect that insight will be shed on that particular question as we get better at um, comparing and learning from in a non-extractive way, non-European culture. So that kind of like wider quest for magic, if you will, um, is the thing that certainly interests me and, and drives me the most. Mm. Can you share one of the more embarrassing experiences of your, of your life with us? Honestly, this was the hardest one because, um, I like to joke that I'm born without shame glands, which is kind of true, but I, um, embarrassing situations. So embarrassment seems to me when you do something human in front of people. So like you mispronounce someone's name at a party or even worse, like your trousers will split if you're, you know, in a, in a meeting and you're, you're presenting at the front of a boardroom or something. And I think about those, not, neither of those things that I've certainly mispronounced people's names, but like, I don't care. I actually, if you think about embarrassment, what it actually is, it's when you have demonstrated that you are a human and thus fallible in, in a public setting. So I, I actually don't think I get embarrassed. I've been humiliated a bunch of times, <laughs> which I think is worse. Um, but I, I think embarrassment is sort of like, oh, I spilled 
like soup on my on my shirt on a date. Like I don't care. I, I, that would be like, oh, this is a thing that happened. And if you mispronounce someone's name or something, you you sincerely apologize. So I don't know. I um I don't think embarrassment is 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 my um, biggest problem. Um, but humiliation has certainly happened, and it's again it comes back to workplace stuff. And humiliation's almost um well, it's a worse feeling, but it's better because it it asks you to confront like who you are. So um, the redundancies have been very humiliating. And, and one of the good examples of that, again, was back in New Zealand at that early, that formative early 20s, where I was a menswear manager for a kind of like luxury. This is back when, you know, I was thin and pretty and I could sell clothes. Um, I was a menswear manager for a sort of large clothing store. And I was too young to have that job. Like, like I didn't get any training for a usual story. And so eventually <laughs> the, the, the store manager was managing me out. And it was really humiliating. And it was humiliating because she was horrible and she wanted to give the job to someone else. Fine. But by the same token, I wasn't that good at it. And so being humiliated in front of like the um, HR manager and, and the area manager and all this, as she was kind of like asking those questions that I didn't have an answer for because I wasn't doing my job properly, was humiliating. But I, it probably needed that humiliation because I wasn't doing my job correctly. And that was my... So the kind of psychological insight or medicine there is um, you probably can't do everything and and you certainly can't do everything without training or trying. So every time I've been humiliated in that situation, it's always been really useful as a as a mirror back on my own kind of psychological shortcomings, which was I was overconfident and and um not only what I fine, I wasn't trained, but I didn't take the time to go and work it out myself anyway. So a lot of those really cruel things that she said to get me out of the business, it's not like she was wrong. She was just cruel. And so there's been situations where I've been humiliated rather than embarrassed. And it's funny. It's almost like that is the mirror that reflects on you. But embarrassment is is reflecting out into culture or out into like, and I'm not embarrassed that I'm a human, like, and I'm not embarrassed by other humans. So if someone, yeah, splits their trousers in a meeting, I'm using that example because that in fact did happen to my boss once. And he was great about it. He's like, no, my trousers split. He went to pick up a pen. Like he put his like, you know, jacket. Uh, around his waist like that and said, oh, I guess I'm swinging home after this meeting. And no one cared. But like, you, if you get embarrassed a lot, there's some work you need to do on yourself, I think, there. Because it's honestly just, as far as I can tell, humans make mistakes and, and you just sort of acknowledge them. And if you're around people who make you feel bad about something like that, jog on. They're, they're not good people. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I may, we might want to look at like changing it to humiliation. It's kind of it's it's yeah. I, my mine was similar about the embarrassment. Like I don't really get embarrassed either. But my my literal answer to that was trouser splitting in the in the gym in front of about fifty or hundred people playing European handball in my pants. Like as I was fifteen, that was embarrassing. Like it, now All I right, would, so, now I wouldn't give yeah. a shit. But mine was literally fifteen. The answer was okay. literally trousers yeah, yeah, yeah. splitting. Yeah. It's so maybe yeah. if you're a kid, yeah, if you're a kid, yeah. you want to like crawl yeah. into a hole yeah, and die. Exactly. Like, yeah. We yeah. need we we need to leave the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I'll make it embarrassing or humiliating. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, because actually, Gordon, sometimes, people, the sometimes questions. people will have a really good embarrassing story, and yeah. maybe you want to hear that. Yeah, like it exactly. Could actually, oh, yeah. Robert Glover's is like, when he pissed himself on the plane. It was a fantastic story. <laughs> well, so that that would be it. Because I was literally going to say, like, if you pissed yourself in front of the Queen or something, yeah, like yeah. this is kind of funny. Yeah. And so you you want to capture that for the show, but I think um, I think humiliation is is more medicinal if you actually process what happens to you. Yeah, that's awesome. What is your greatest fear and how do you overcome it? Um, this is almost like the embarrassment question. And it's I know it's a weird flex, um, but I don't get that scared of things. I'm certainly not scared of death anymore. Um, and and the things I like tend to fear. I like snakes and spiders and sharks and, and whatever. Like, So I can't even go to a phobic level. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sort of sat with this question for a little while. And I think my biggest fear was living a prosaic life, um, sort of growing up in regional Australia and, and living a life that didn't leave regional Australia was sort of middling and, you know, 
that was my biggest fear and how I overcame it was by having adventures essentially you overcome it by overcoming it mm-hmm. but I honestly think my biggest fear and it isn't even and I, I was wondering if this was the case it's not even a vanity like oh I need to be remembered like I need to be a famous filmmaker and, and I need to be remembered or whatever it's not even that it's honestly I was terrified of a boring life um of a it just horrifies me and and I, i'm definitely over that fear now and i think funnily enough speaking in new zealand it was that rather than all the other subsequent adventures and sunken cities and whatever which tumbled on from it it was leaving australia with a suitcase and my camera and five days accommodation booked in a backpack as in auckland and kind of showing up and trying to build it was like a game show because the internet wasn't that good back then and you ha- having to find a house and a job in those five days using a combination of really shitty classified websites at the time and newspapers those were like the best five days of my life um in in many respects because it was terrifying but it was that absolute freedom of adventure so i think my biggest fear has this is such a flex um i'm sure i'll be scared of something else but i think my biggest fear has in fact is something i've in fact overcome and it was that having a prosaic life because ever since then like my life is weird it's not like it's heroic in a aragon sense but um it's certainly not normal and and i i think that's what i was most scared of for better or for worse i think that'll resonate with a lot of people I mean, I think well, that's, that's fairly similar with a, a few of the answers. I mean, yeah. that was kind of similar with my answer as well as kind of, you know, not leaving any mark or just sort of being, you know, an extra. Yeah. And, and it's in the, your own just movie, right? Pretty much when it would, and it will be your fault if that's the case. Yeah. And, and so many people that, fall into yeah. it where they're, where they're more caught up with some character in some sitcom than they are with yeah. what's happening in their own life. And they've just given all their personal power to the dude from, I don't know, Game of Thrones or whatever, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's sad. Uh, yeah, so that, I think that's, that's, that's it. Um, and I know it sounds like a bit of a flex, but I mean, like yourselves, we've, I've, it's not like this was handed to me. I, I worked on it over the course of several decades. Like, um, so it's not like, oh, I was born without fear. It's like, this probably is my fear. And, and after 20 years of attacking it, I no longer have it. And I think, you know, we can take that win. Yeah. Well, it seems to be, you know, because that answer's come up in different forms in a, in a few interviews now. So it seems to me maybe you know, it's like an inherent male thing that it's just like, you know, we have this we have this built-in thing to to just not be an extra in your own movie and it seems like it's harder that you know and that might just be because of the times like that probably wasn't that hard a couple hundred years ago you're busy living but, life constantly true i but i also think um so if i mean archetypally it's it archetypally it's presented more as a male in, in the sort of Jungian sense right um although not necessarily and but i also think Previous existences, you might be onto something there, had the opportunity for more of that kind of authentic engagement with adventure. So one of the things I enjoy about living in this context is if I don't chop wood, the house is cold and I die. Um, and and that sort of there's there's much more living authentically down here. Like my neighbors will swing by with um, deer or wallaby that they've shot to go in the chest freezer. I'm going to join them eventually, but um, it's Australia, so you need gun licenses and all that kind of stuff that have been too busy. And it's I think the opportunity for the for the heroic or for the overcoming of of a dull life. You're right. We're, we're there in you couldn't not have an adventurous life prior to sort of not even late capitalism but almost like mid or post-war capitalism and the rise of the suburbs yeah yeah absolutely what quality do you most admire in a man and why so this is another question you want to phrase because i want to say lower body flexibility (laughs) (laughs) well you know what i actually we should keep it the other version because we had two versions of this question and one the other one was what qualities should a man strive for in today's world um, no, I like. It. I just wanted to make a gay joke, but I like it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's a weird way of describing it, but there. And funnily enough, the qualities that that we're talking about in a non-sexy way that we most that I most admire in a man, I also kind of admire in like an older, like grandmotherly woman. And I'm trying to find the right description for it in the male sense. Is like a. It's like a quiet self-assurance. 
rather than a brash confidence. Mm. And I, I joke and call it like big dad energy. And the person who comes to mind is my um, builder. And he lives, he's actually a dad. He's got a couple of young kids and lives uh, the next bay over. And um, he didn't, he just inspired confidence by being around him, even though the stuff that he was doing, like he was a trained builder, or he's a trained builder. But there were things that were new about this project that he didn't know how to do yet. And so he wasn't brash, like, hi, oh, I can do anything. He was just quietly like, oh, you know, we'll work that out. And there's just being around someone who has that that kind of confidence rather than brashness. Um, and also there's a, there's a, what's the word I'm looking for here? It's vulnerable rather than brash. So I have a very locally famous black tiger snake that lives underneath the deck of the guest house. And I sort of mentioned that to him as he was pulling up the deck. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's the hole where the tiger snake lives. And he's like, listen, if I see a tiger snake, I am gone. And so he wasn't even, there was no bravado about it. We didn't see the snake and he still was, he still built the deck around <laughs> the, the snake habitat and whatever. He was just aware of it. And so there's some kind of, quiet confidence rather than arrogance or brashness. And and this is why I say it, it's almost a grandmother energy as well, because um, older women can inspire that same, like, well, I've actually pretty much seen it all at this point. And although I don't know everything, I'm sure we'll kind of like work out what's going on, but it is expressed differently in in males. And, and that's, I think, the most admirable that's the thing I admire most. If you can have that brash self-confidence that is is a weird combination of of um humility and like get through itness. Again, we need better term. Maybe the Germans have a word for it. I don't know. <laughs> English <laughs> seems to be the worst at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's actually funny because I work with a, a Lebanese guy and he mentioned that he's like, we have less less miscommunication because we have like 30% more words. He's like, it's a thing. English is constraining. It is. It's still less. Um, I mean, we have quite a few more words in other European languages. It's just that the way German is structured means you can kind of connect them together and make ones if you don't. But uh, <laughs> the Eng English, um, we steal. So like the, in terms of Anglo words, there are fewer, but um non-English words incorporate into English at a, at a greater clip than they do into, say, French or something. So your Lebanese friend is right, but you can also say, yeah, but we're better at stealing. So <laughs> We're, like, we're going to get there eat. eventually. Yeah. <laughs> we'll outpace you. Yeah. Who were or are your role models and why? Do they have to be people I know? Is it like a mentor thing? No, or? no it can be anyone. Um. Again, like the ones that I do know are parents, and in particular, in a funny way, um, in a funny way, my mother, I think, exemplifies a lot of lessons to do with um, sacrifice and and um, and forgiveness and knowing when to bend and and when not to. So it's just this strange combination of an excellent mother, but also will just like turn around and casually stop tyranny. Like she's sued large companies and, <laughs> and uh, there was a sewage works near the primary school that I went to that built all these, you know, treatment tanks and they didn't cap them. And she's like, what the hell is this? And so she sort of like takes on these sort of random causes and sponsors nuns that she knows personally in Nepal and whatever. So she's, she's a role model in, in a lot of ways about how you can kind of, when I'm in a good mood, mother's a role model um there have been people i've worked for um a guy again sort of like my next mentor 10 years later in in london who'd previously run like a private spy agency and so on and he just his whole career is essentially being helicoptered into media companies to sort of do them up so that they can get sold so he had all these stuff and he was kind of like my first mentor worked really really hard but in the end didn't care um just kind of kept it really worked really, really hard and made a bunch of money and lives in this sort of palace in Stratford upon Avon now. And he did not come from money. Like he, this was all him and he just didn't care. And so like that attitude, there's almost like a captain Jack Sparrow attitude to, to how he does life. Um, so those are, those are role models, I guess, that are kind of like in my life. Um, Pete Carroll is from a combination of magic and life living uh, and and writing perspective because his the the sort of trajectory of his life he got he spent his younger years doing the boho thing lived in India a couple of times building boats lived in Australia and so on and you know lived in squats in in London and sort of experimented with magic and and so on and then kind of hit 
an early 30s moment and decided whilst he's still you know, does magic and is exploring his own kind of experimental physics stuff. He's kind of went home and built a successful small business and raised some kids and, and like writes his books and has his ideas and just kind of does all that stuff. And and so in that respect, he would be almost like a professional mentor. The same thing, anyone who does magic and lives magic, like, and has the adventures on the other side of that is Dr. Stephen Skinner, who has had a very different life. Uh, and an interest in magic to Pete Carroll. They're kind of on the opposites, but he's the same. Like he's uh, pursues degrees all over the world and, and lives in Singapore and has lived in France and had his own woods where he'd be doing grimoire experimentation and, you know, publishes and translates grimoires and just lives all over and, and has adventures, but still, and I don't want to say, I don't want to prioritize the money making, but by the same token, um, you do need money to live the life you want. And and so people in a different way, Pete Carroll and, and Stephen Skinner are, are role models in the sense that they've managed to combine and indeed use magic to have that adventurous life that also has money. Awesome. Yeah. That's excellent. This will be a fun one. It makes sense. <laughs> what institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? I think if I could introduce like um, a, a couple of lines of code or a script that could decentralize anything that could possibly be decentralized. So that would be how I would do it. So you could either introduce it at like at a um, federal government level or whatever country people are listening to this in, right? Essentially a policy that says, can this be decentralized down to a lower level? Because some things can't, the military can't, but most things can and uh, and I think that would be a night and day change to everything, including you wouldn't get, um, and I mean everything down to um, local environmental improvement and all the rest of it. That would be it. Like it, we we have a cosmic drive towards the centralizing, and 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 God is in the decentral, as far as I'm concerned. Like that would be that would be it. Rather than like, oh, I would want to make education free. That's not going to solve anything. Like it would be much. I would prefer to see in some kind of like code insertion way, um, essentially a rule, can this be decentralized? If so, decentralize it. Wow, yeah, that's great. 100%. Yeah. I mean, that ultimate centralization kind of just leads to that like USSR sort of one guy's mood Absolutely. sort of runs everything. Yeah. And it's like, you know, if he gets a crush on your woman or something like that, now you're in all sorts of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's the great warning of like Gnosticism or even the Tower of Babel. It's like centralization leads to destruction, and it does. And and if you look at how the how living systems organize, it's it's a decentral system. So we're we're like out of kilter with the universe, and that is probably at the root of quite a number of our problems and risks and medium term risks like war and so on. Yeah. Yeah. What is the most courageous thing you have ever done in your life and seen? Um, it probably is. It probably is going to New Zealand because it's it's. And so I've sort of done that a few times. I have this perennial need, and it's coming back to that fear question. So fear and and courage are obviously you know courage is acting in the presence of fear, right? We all mm -hmm. know the quote. Um, if, if the life is at risk of being prosaic, I will burn it down. <laughs> and so I think the first time I realized you actually could do that was when I bought a one-way ticket from Sydney to Auckland on my own at, at 21 and left my job and showed up to do that. I think that was the most courageous thing. Again, there's I've kind of done some, because I like sharks and snakes and things, like I've kind of done cool stuff like wreck diving and shark diving, but that's only courageous if you're scared of sharks. Like, it's, it's not really courageous. I enjoy it. Um, I, I think it's... Yeah, I, I think it was that first time I kind of like leapt into, admittedly, it's just next door, but like I leapt into a foreign country without knowing anyone and without a job <laughs> and without any money. And and that was probably, um, in terms of things I've seen that are courageous, and this is like, I'm sure, again, if you live long enough, once in Kensington, for instance, I saw a guy um do that classic thing of of um, pulling a little kid that had run out into the road. And he had to step the whole way out and do the spin thing. And, and just as a kind of bus was going by and it missed him by, you know, a few inches. So I've seen that. And that is, let me not, you know, let's, let me, 
that is courageous. Like, <laughs> well done to that guy who saved some stranger's kid from being hit by a car, for sure. Um, but I, I'm thinking about it more, and I think it's actually how my grandfather faced death. Um, because, you know, he's dead and we got to see him die. And I think it was that. I think in his dying moments and his last words were essentially, I know God will take care of Joyce, which was, you know, my grandmother, his wife. But I, that was the first time I'd seen someone die in front of me. And it was actually really courageous. And there was just a, a stoicism and in, in how he did it. Uh, hats off. Uh, I think it was literally watching my grandfather die. And, and, and his last thoughts were of his wife being taken care of rather than what the hell's going to happen now. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was hugely impressive. Yeah. Excellent. What rule do you have for yourself that you never break? And why do you think that it's important? I, honestly, that's, that's when I would struggle with um, you because you will always find exceptions. Um, you'll always find exceptions to, like ethical guidelines. So I'm not sure I haven't imposed a rule on myself that I haven't broken. <laughs> um, like, I, hmm. yeah, it, it's tough. Like, it's going to be something to do with regular magical practice. I'm sure of it. Like, it's going to be something like, well, I'll never not do magic, but I don't think I couldn't. Like, I, I don't think that would be a thing I could stop doing. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this, I don't have like a moral guy, like, you know, I have all the normal non-psychopathic ones, like don't hit children and, and all that kind of thing. But um, I don't have like a, a rule that like I absolutely have to do that. It's a, it's a struggle. I'm, I'm pretty allergic to rules, not going to lie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tends to happen. That's a good answer right there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right on. Well, that wraps up the, uh, the free section of the show where we go through the 13 questions. Of course, we had some fantastic answers here from Gordon. Uh, we're going to jump into the bonus questions here in the wrap up right away. Uh, of course, if you want to, if you want to get access to that, head over to 13 questions, podcast.com today and head over to the sign up page and it'll, you know, gives you a rundown of all the things we offer there, the communications courses and, uh, all that great open stuff. Open sourcing. Open sourcing the podcast. We got our first open source podcast sent in from Stevie in Scotland the other day. So we're going to drop that in the feed in a couple of days. Yeah. Do all that great stuff. Thanks for listening. And into the bonus section, we got a, an, a we're, we're throwing an extra question into the bonus section just for you, Gordon. And that oh, is, shucks. were you a weird kid? <laughs> Absolutely was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sort of, uh, like I mentioned, the hitting the reading milestones earlier. Um, I hit the verbal ones as well. So I would, um, so I was precocious, I think, in, in the stuff I was interested in, and that kind of led to um, some unusual um, some unusual adventures. But like the the, the reading, aid, like it, my mother's a psychologist, and my gra my um, father's a psychiatrist, and they weren't sure what kind of like strange hyperverbal <laughs> alien they had. Um, Dad has some really fun stories, again, Lord of the Rings ones, like um, but my closest friend growing up with this girl, growing up with this girl called Jessica, and they went through um, the Steiner School system, which I actually. I don't want no hard work no. I don't want no hard work no. No what? I don't want no hard work no. I don't want no hard work no. No what? I don't want no hard work no. I don't want no hard work no. No what? I don't want no hard work no. I don't want no hard work no. No what? I don't want no hard work no. I don't want no hard work no. No what? I don't want no hard work no. I don't want no hope when they know what Is one man rich and another man poor Why we ain't satisfied, why we gotta have more Why your suicide rates on the rest so high Why I tell you the truth but you say don't lie Why is being a good father at an all time low Why is it acceptable, yo, why I don't know Why she blame him and he blame her, it's useless Ask yourself this question, why you making excuses Why do parents gotta bury their kids Why we text and drive, not caring how scary it is is. Why you so hard to forgive and leave the past behind? And if you did, then that's divine. Why don't you help your brother when you see him fall? Why do we act like God don't see it all? Why do we call them black, them white, them Asians and use labels? 
Now that's racism. I don't wanna hold you. 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 Why is it racism? Locked up for life While some people can't say nothing nice Why do we always gotta question What all of it means And why won't you follow your dreams Tell me why The night when you took my dad Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry And tell me why And why do you choose to hide Even though you was born to fly And tell me why And why don't we turn from all the hate And why don't we learn from all mistakes Why do I keep on wrecking these fat beats And teachers don't make more than professional athletes And why, and why, and why And why, and why, and why, and why? I don't wanna hold you 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 I don't wanna hold you. 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 This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.